say first, full credit to Chase Oliver is merited because it's his tweet this morning that reminded me of something big, something truly significant in the history of professional wrestling happened 10 years ago on this day. Today being, at the time of this recording, October 10th, 2020, what else could I be referencing but the 10 year anniversary of Bound for Glory 2010? 10, 10, 10, they're coming, they're coming, they're coming. And seeing that tweet from Chase, staring square in front of my face today. I gotta tell you honestly, it's got me in my wrestling feelings just a little bit. It was 10 years ago this day that the big reveal happened. 10, 10, 10, they're coming, they're coming, they're coming. Damn, do I miss TNA. I, I miss WCW and ECW, sure. But I would argue there is a sizable part of me because of how important that brand, that company was to my early years here on YouTube talking about professional wrestling, that that's the company I miss the most. And I know some of you are gonna say it technically still exists, but to me, it doesn't, it's dead. And that's a tragedy, and that's so sad. Like there is, for the past few years, been a huge gaping void, a hole in my wrestling heart that used to be filled by TNA, by Impact Wrestling on Spike TV. And that is there no longer. So I had a whole flood of memories and moments come back to me today from TNA's history. And I miss that company, man. There was always kind of the redheaded stepchild element to it. There was always the inferiority complex to it. There was always the ravenously stupid things that they would do. But by God, in spite of all of that, and sometimes because of it, I loved that damn company and I loved TNA. I loved Impact Wrestling. Used to be a highlight of my week to be able to watch that show, be able to come on YouTube each week and review that show for all of you. It is a bygone era of my wrestling life that sadly will never, ever come back again. Bound for Glory 2010, moving on to the show took place in Daytona Beach, Florida, had about 3,500 or so paying customers. I know, right? Back in the day, it was where TNA, when they got out of the impact zone, could draw a little bit of a house. The big, big focus here, the big storyline heading in, was for weeks and weeks, you had been talking about 10, 10, 10. They're coming, they're coming, here's the best. They're coming, they're coming, they're coming. So here, at Bound for Glory, what we certainly had a pretty good feeling was going to happen in terms of some of who was going to be involved. We were ultimately tuning in to find out who indeed was coming, was coming, was coming. I will spend a little bit of time talking about some of the things on the show, but let's be realistic here. There are only a couple of things that really matter, so let's not spend too much time on the devil of the details of things that you don't even remember from 10 years ago. Opening match was for the TNA World Tag Team Championships. Generation Me taking on the Motor City Machine Guns. The Fool Killer Classic. Oh, good old Fool Killer. Deuces and fours. Never forgot about you. Just want you to know that. Even though you've moved on to bigger and better things. We'll always have a soft spot in our hearts for you, Fool Killer. That's all I'm saying. I don't know what the hell name you're going by anymore, and it doesn't really matter. Just like Generation Me. Oh boy, it's the Young Bucks, the Bucks of Suck. This stupid spot fest, flippy, freaky fight. I'm sure a lot of you love it. To me, it just makes me largely want to vomit. But Motor City Machine Guns win 
and it's whatever. Imagine you're Vince Russo and TNA's creative. You've got Tara on your roster. You've got Mickey James on your roster. And to a lesser degree, you even have the beautiful people and the original ones, Angelina Love, Velvet Sky. But somehow, someway, we had to make all this heading into it revolve around Madison Rain. <laughs> the dope face, Madison Rain. <laughs> oh my god. I forgot about how stupid this shit was in 2010. Tara being the heifer. Riding on the bike with the motorcycle helmet. Who is it? Who is it? And then basically kind of serving as Madison Rain's lackey. And, oh, yeah, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. That's pretty much all you can say about this match. It was a four corners fatal four way knockouts championship match in TNA in 2010. How the hell do you think this went? At least Tara won. But in reality, the only thing that this company cared about at the time with that knockouts division was what they were going to do the following Thursday when they brought in Jay Wild from the Jersey Shore. Yeah! That's how far back we go with this. Horrible. Oh, God. More bad. 2010 TNA. Ink Ink versus the team of Eric Young and Orlando Jordan. Here comes Eric Young with the TNA rule. Oh, <laughs> God. Uh, uh. Remember how weird 2010 Orlando Jordan was? Holy Christ. Eek, eek. <laughs> what was it, Shannon and Jesse? Oh, God. This match was a time. It sucked. Man, Eric Young turned out of Orlando Jordan. It's just a reminder of some of the stupidity you had to go through during this period of time in TNA's history. The <laughs> Division Championship saw Douglas Williams defeat Jay Lethal. Again, yes, we're going 10 years back in time, folks. That's a long, long time ago, but it maybe doesn't feel that so long for some of us. But good Lord Almighty, I never really got the buzz behind Douglas Williams. I never really understood what the big deal was. I thought he was a thrift store third-rate knockoff of William Regal and not in a kind way. Like, admittedly, though, just as this match was kind of starting to maybe get a little good, it ended! How many matches could you say that about back in the day with TNA? It just wouldn't be 2010 TNA if he didn't have a Monsters Ball match every three months featuring Abyss and somebody. In this case, it was RVD. Let's forget about getting whacked with freaking Janice and making it look like RVD's dead. We're here at this match instead. And even before the match, you got Abyss talking about, they're coming, they're coming, they're coming. And he's been prophesizing it for months. What are you more concerned about, the promo or the damn match? I mean, the match was okay. It was kind of standard Monsters Ball stuff. But, of course, RVD eventually nails Abyss with Janice. Ends up in the five-star frog splash, and he wins. And then at the end, Abyss is sitting there drawing the camera close, even though he just lost, because again, that's what TNA did in 2010. Abyss is supposed to be foretelling this big thing about their coming, so he loses, and he loses to the former ECWWE guy in Rob Van Dam, because again, that's the stupidity of 2010 TNA. Even then, Abyss is still focused on not the fact that he just got his ass kicked by Rob Van Dam, but that it's 10, 10, 10. They're coming. They're coming. Up the handicap tag match is three on two. The band, what a mix here. The Pope, Kevin Nash, and Sting, who for weeks have been sitting there and trying to warn Dixie, but instead of coming out right and flat out telling her what was going on and what was going to happen later on in the show, they just had to be all cryptic and mysterious about it, which led to this match. Those three taking on what was originally going to be a team, including Hulk Hogan, but due to the back problems he was having at the time, the back surgery he had, he had to, he had to be removed from it. It became a handicap match against Samoa Joe. And no, 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 no. Just because we're talking about TNA, no, I know what you're thinking. I know where you're going. And I'm in a different place now. What you're thinking you're about to get and what you want, it's not happening. 
I'm going to be an unbiased wrestling journalist. Because, God damn it, we're professionals here! I'm not, I'm not going to cave. It, it, it's not happening. It is a little warm in here, though. Ten, ten, ten. They're coming! They're coming! They're coming! And and this was where the show just. I'm not gonna do it. I'm not gonna do it. I'm gonna focus on the good times. Focus on the Pope is pimping in TNA. And Samoa Joe surviving his battles with ninjas to, to be here at this time. But they just couldn't leave Neff alone, could they? They just couldn't leave well enough alone. Just couldn't do it. Good job. Couldn't let this one slide by. After all those years you were hoping that finally enough was enough. But now! Marquee matches of the night was the lethal lockdown match. EV 2.0 taking on Ric Flair's fortune group, including the DNA of TNA, the blueprint, Matt Morgan. And my God. My God I just, again, all, like, all these memories are flooding back to me. But hey, in all seriousness, the lethal lockdown match here was very good. You know, you had a lot of extreme stuff. Like, the story, you know, had enough elements there, I guess, where it kind of worked. Um, and if you were a fan of the old ECW, you got to see several of these guys. So cool. You know, if you're a fan of Ric Flair and Foley, you got to see them scrap at one point in time. But you still couldn't get away from some of the weirdness that was this era of TNA. Because eventually, it's two of the guys was Kazarian and I forget who the hell else it was. It was Kazarian. You guys are going to have to help me in the comments. I'm drawing a blank right now, admittedly. Get up on the top of the freaking lockdown cage. 
You got a table up there. You got a freaking ladder up there. And then hiding under a freaking sheet is freaking the Brian Kendrick in that weird ass kind of meditating yoga zen bullshit gimmick that he had. And he ends up putting Kazarian through the table on top of the freaking cage. Like it was nuts. And as soon as that happens, basically, you cut away to the ring. And here's AJ Styles getting put into a chair by Tommy Dreamer. And of course... Knowing where they're going to go with this fortune group almost immediately, or maybe they didn't because it was TNA, and they did everything by the seat of their damn pants, it felt like at this time. But instead of having this group go over the ECW guys, who most of them were not going to be major contributors to you going forward, like, thanks for some of the contributions in 2010, let's never talk about hardcore justice ever again. You still have the ECW guys go over... The TNA guys, and not only that, you have them go over the guy that was the franchise player in AJ freaking Styles. Who does that? So a weird-ass Brian Kendrick reveal leading to the ECW guys led by Tommy Dreamer getting the win over AJ Styles. God, TNA used to make my blood boil. As much as I've talked about these other things that happened on Bound for Glory 2010, this really, truly was a one-match show. Now, you knew coming into the main event that Slap Nuts was going to be whatever was a part of this whole they thing. They're coming. They're coming. 10, 10, 10. They're coming. They're coming. And obviously, Abyss, being the, the foreteller of all of this, he was going to be involved. And everybody, I think, knew the writing was on the wall that Hogan and Bischoff were calling the shots and running the show here. Like, that wasn't a surprise to anybody. And when that was eventually going to be revealed in this match, wasn't going to be a surprise to anybody. But what it really was going to come down to is who are you going to roll with? It's a triple threat for the vacant TNA World Heavyweight Championship. It's Kurt Angle, it's Jeff Hardy, and Mr. Anderson. And I will tell you, going back in time to 2010, most people, I think, somewhat rightfully assumed that they were going with Mr. Anderson. That they were going to put the strap on him. That he was going to be the guy. He was going to be the one that Hogan and Bischoff aligned themselves to. Maybe it would be Kurt Angle to give him a different spin on his character. But there were very few people outside of some of those, I think, from remembering at the time, that were actually thinking it could be Jeff Hardy. Like, they just didn't see this coming. And when you look at the reaction, when that moment in time actually happened, from what was up to that point in time, a pretty good match. Like, it shocked a lot of people. It's easy to say 10 years later it wasn't that big of a deal. But at the time, Jeff Hardy turning heel and aligning himself with Hogan and Bischoff was a huge deal for TNA. Don't ever undersell that. Don't ever undercut its importance or its significance. Because it certainly the hell did matter. And you can sit there and say whatever you want, but the fact that fans were pelting the ring with their food and their drinks and garbage... After the end of this show, like, that's the type of heel that I know Bischoff used to love. And he was a Mark Ford. And frankly, I was a Mark Ford, too, and still am. I understand you don't get that much anymore in wrestling. Your safety concerns and the business has changed and everything else. But, man, when I talk about eliciting reactions out of folks, like, good or bad, get an effing reaction. This got a reaction. Unfortunately, most everything else immediately after this was complete and total drizzling shit. But this was a big deal at the time. And I would even say just from a surprise factor standpoint, just from a you never saw this coming standpoint, from a, hey, Jeff Hardy, you know, when Hogan came in and Bischoff came in on January 4th, 2010 show, who was one of the big first reveals. It was freaking Jeff Hardy. Remember when he couldn't get on top of the freaking cage or Homicide couldn't get on top of the freaking cage? Like, yeah. You could actually make the argument that it made sense. Now, of course, because of the TNA writing at the time, none of this did make sense. There were gaping plot holes all over the freaking place. Like, why is the founder doing all these menial jobs and then all of a sudden now he's a part of this group and you never really address that? You're not even trying to sit there and pretend like you care to take the quality of, of in your pride in your work to sit there and say, hey, you know what? We had Abyss and this guy doing this crap because of these reasons. And then that happened. And then it just became a huge cluster of schmoz, 
as you now rolled fortune into this new group called Immortal and Ah! But man, going back and watching this, like, this was a really big thing at the time. It wasn't like a seismic shift in the professional wrestling business, and it didn't increase TNA's viewership significantly or increase their box office or their gate significantly necessarily. But in terms of interest and in terms of what the hell is going on and what they're going to do next, like this was a pretty big deal at the time. And when you look at some of the different things you could do, and yes, it ultimately was involving old-ass Hogan and old-ass Bischoff, and you knew what path this was going down, and it's just basically another rip-off NWO. You know, like even I think the following week on Impact, if I remember correctly, the fans were chanting, uh, same old shit, same old shit, because it was, basically. Um, but man, like it was a pretty good title match until you got to the end, and then it got kind of clunky. But if you're going to do screwball, do screwball in a way that people don't see coming and evokes all types of emotions out of them. Now, just also make sure you keep Jeff Hardy away from the medications a few months later when you have him scheduled to main event a pay-per-view as your world champion against Sting. You were asking me to grade the actual show itself. Uh, the undercard was pretty underwhelming and weak. It was. A monster's ball match is a monster's ball match, but you've seen... 300 of them, you've seen all 5,000. Lethal Lockdown was very good, but of course they had the old guys go over the face of the company in AJ Styles. And the main event, that was a solid match up until the end. And the end, man, like the end was something. Like I always enjoyed that twist. I liked that decision. It did not work out well, ultimately. And that's where you get the benefit of hindsight is 2020 through the lens of history and time, but this show, going back and watching it again today, like this all came together very quickly. From the time Chase Oliver tweeted this to the, oh my God, that's right, it was 10 years ago. Oh my God, I just tell you this from time to time, but it really got me in my wrestling feelings about how badly I really miss TNA. Um, going back and watching the show, man, the good, the bad, the stupid, I loved watching every single minute of it. I enjoyed it so much. And hopefully you guys enjoyed this review. Yeah. So anyways, if you enjoyed this, smash that subscribe button, click the bell so that way you're notified of future videos. Like this video, share it far, share it wide. 10, 10, 10! We're coming! We're coming! They're coming! They came! And in a few years, most of the fans went.